Well, all right, guys, I am so glad you're here as we continue on with our look at our Lord in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, if you hear my wife singing, she's in the other room practicing. She's a worship leader, and so uh, she's over there practicing. So that'd be a blessing. And as we've been seeing, Jesus is enjoying great success in his ministry. Therefore, while he's been in Capernaum, large crowds have been gathering all around him. It's exciting. People are healed. The dead are raised, demons are cast out, and storms are calmed. But suddenly, in our passage today, we move from the excitement in Capernaum to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, where they reject that he's anything special and refuse to believe he can do anything extraordinary. It's a place of such spiritual dullness and unbelief that he can't do much at all. Let's read it. Mark 6, 1-6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. So just a little bit of background here. This is not Jesus' first attempt to minister in his hometown. Luke records another event that occurred right at the beginning of his ministry about a year earlier. Jesus had gone into the synagogue, and reading from Isaiah, he confronted their unbelief. Now they took such offense at this that they dragged him to a cliff to throw him off, but not being God's time or God's appointed way for him to die, this attempt failed. So in the very beginning of his ministry here in his hometown, he's already encountered radical unbelief. And could this be why he left Nazareth? to set up his headquarters in Capernaum. But this passage also shows the great patience of God that he'd return to minister again in this place where he'd been so harshly rejected. And aren't you glad God didn't accept your initial rejection as final, that he continued to approach you? This also shows the value of a soul to God. Now think of this. Jesus was willing to leave a successful and exciting ministry in Capernaum to walk, to walk, to Nazareth, approximately 70 miles away, where he knew the majority would reject him, all for the sake of the few who wouldn't. So we learn that no amount of work is too much if it can reach a soul. Well, that's the introduction, but the main lesson we will see is the tragic cost of unbelief. And my goal is to make us think about this so that we'll challenge ourselves to a greater faith. Here's our outline. Rejected at home, the cause of unbelief, the foolishness of unbelief, the damage of unbelief, and the cure for unbelief. So, rejected in his hometown. Look at Mark 6, 1 through 2. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And so the initial reaction to his return, it's good, isn't it? He's in the synagogue, he begins to teach, and they're amazed at what they're hearing. I mean, such anointing, such wisdom. Every word comes with the full authority of God behind it. Plus, they had heard of all the miracles he was performing. So they were rightly amazed at this man. But it says things begin to change as they're talking about him. Their thinking moves from amazement to resentment, and even to anger. Look at verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And look at this. And they took offense at him. So they're amazed. But then somebody who knew what he had done for a living brings that up. Hey, isn't he just a carpenter? A common laborer like us? Who does he think he is coming here acting like some big shot teacher? claiming we should follow him. And isn't he the son of Mary? Now that was a cheap shot. Sons were identified by their fathers, 
even when the father was dead. So they are insinuating that Mary was a loose woman who became pregnant before she was married. So, you know, who really knows who his father is? They're suggesting Jesus was the illegitimate result of Mary's immorality. So how dare somebody with a background like that come to us good, respectable folk and try to teach us the ways of God? If anybody needs teaching about moral issues, it would be him. And they add, isn't he the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? We know his family, and there's nothing special there. He hasn't come from royalty or the upper class. Listen, you may be able to fool those people over in Capernaum, but we watched you grow up. We watched you labor as a carpenter. We know about that little incident with Mary and her pregnancy. We know how common your family is. You lived with us, and you lived like us, and the rest of your family still does. So come down off your high horse and stop acting like you're some spiritual giant. I mean, this is typical stuff after powerful teaching. The devil offers one lie after another to steal the truth, doesn't he? And here we see how true the saying, familiarity breeds contempt is. Because they knew him as a commoner, they couldn't embrace him as anything more. In other words, it was hard for them to accept anything new because of what they thought they knew. And there is a warning here for us, I believe. We may become so familiar with the things of God, such as the doctrines in Scripture, the person of Christ, and the incredible things that happen at salvation that we're no longer thrilled by any of it. We're no longer moved to adoration and worship. The thought of glory just you know, sort of loses its luster, while the idea of hell loses its terror. Therefore, our worship is hindered, and the urgency that should be there to reach the lost is lost. If this is happening, you need to see the danger and correct it. You're starting to drift. Cry out to God for fresh fire in your heart and return to the disciplines that keep us spiritually healthy, such as Bible study, prayer, and fellowship. Begin to read your Bible with fresh eyes to see the beauty of Christ and the magnificence of God. So they refused to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Why? Because they thought they knew who he was, a commoner just like them. One who grew up amongst them, worked in a local carpenter shop, and whose family was still there. Add to that that whole scandal of a pregnant mother before marriage. And as we move on, we're going to see how this lack of faith is going to block the blessings of God in their life. But let's look at the problem of unbelief, you know, so we can understand it and correct it in our own life. And we're going to see the cause of unbelief, the foolishness of unbelief, the damage of unbelief, and then the cure for unbelief. First of all, the cause of unbelief. We've already seen the problem of familiarity, but there's another cause of unbelief I think we need to see. Their view of reality was dictated only by what they saw in the temporal realm, and they refused to look beyond what they were used to so they could embrace the eternal truths Jesus was speaking about. We know what we've seen with our eyes. We saw you grow up, watched you work, and still see your family now. See, they just couldn't get past what was right in front of their eyes to see the spiritual. They couldn't get past the temporal they were familiar with to embrace the eternal. Now, does that sound familiar? Well, I think we all struggle with this problem. We are prone to walk by sight and not by faith. In other words, we use only what we see to determine what reality is. Then that dictates how we think, feel, and respond. So let's look at this idea of walking by sight and not by faith, and be honest here. See if you can relate. I know I can. Walking by sight happens whenever adverse circumstances crash into our lives, and we only see the situation without filtering it through the truth of God's Word. Therefore, this unfiltered circumstance will dictate how we think, and our thinking will always control how we feel, or our emotions. And our emotions, not controlled by faith, that is built upon God's truth, will always take us where we don't want to go, down into fear and despair. That is why thinking correctly is absolutely essential, isn't it? So walking by sight and not by faith means what I see will dictate how I think, which will determine how I feel. But the scriptures tell us to live out the Christian life. We've got to reverse that order. The Bible exhorts us to walk by faith and not by sight. And this is a radically different way to approach the way we live, isn't it? 
It's an approach that says, what I see is not the final authority for how I think and feel. Faith says, regardless of what I see, I believe there's something going on behind the scenes that is good and valuable. I trust that a divine hand is controlling it all for his glory and for my good. I believe God, my loving Father, never makes mistakes in what he allows in my life. And adverse circumstances will never tell you that, right? Instead, they shout out that everything is falling apart. So fear and panic would be the appropriate response. And have you noticed your emotions will take any negativity and use your imagination to fashion all kinds of worst case scenarios? A multitude of ways this is going to ruin you. But faith answers, no, it's not going to ruin me. Eventually, I will see good from this because my father promised. Well, sound good? Well, let's work this out. How to do it practically, because I think this is so important. First, this means we must become thinkers and not just reactors. When adversity comes into our lives, many of us just respond immediately and emotionally. But you must change that initial immediate reaction from emotional to intellectual. You must learn to stop yourself and say, I have to think right now. What does the Bible say? See, we can't allow circumstances to hit us unfiltered with full impact. We must force those circumstances through the grid of divine truth and promises. God is sovereign. He is in control. He never makes a mistake. This is for my good. He is my Father who promised to care for me and provide for me. Scripture says that this trial is so valuable I should embrace it with joy and thanksgiving. So to walk by faith rather than sight is a determined choice that says what I see isn't the whole picture. Instead, by faith, we rest in the truth that God is moving behind the scenes for good. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. See, we don't always see what God is doing at the moment a trial hits. We don't see that sure foundation of hope built on the promises. We just see the adversity. But walking by faith is not letting that adversity determine what reality is. We must impose divine truth on our circumstances that tell us God is involved in this thing, and he is doing good things for me, and eventually I will see that. Now, to drive this home, let's look at how foolish unbelief is. So this is the foolishness of unbelief. To live in unbelief, we must close our eyes to the plain evidence of Scripture that provides the ammunition to fight for joy with. We close our eyes to all the passages that show God's loving character towards His children. We close our eyes to all the promises from a God who cannot lie. We close our eyes to God's sovereignty and how He uses adversity for His children's good. We close our eyes to the commands such as, Cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. And do not be anxious about anything. Why? Because of the weight of all this truth. And we must close our eyes to the history of God's faithfulness in our own life. His incredible track record where he has never failed us. So unbelief of the believer, it's just not logical, is it? Not in light of the truths we claim to believe in this book. And God wants to challenge us in passages like the one before us to not accept unbelief so easily. We need to see it as a thief, a robber of our joy and peace. So we've seen a cause of unbelief, being so familiar with the old, we aren't open to anything new. Then we looked at walking by sight and not by faith, where we let what we see dictate how we think and respond. Then we ended with the foolishness of unbelief. To doubt God, you must close your eyes to so much reality in the scriptures and in your own life. Next, let's look at the damage of unbelief, our fourth point. Look at Mark 6, 4 through 6. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. So unbelief hinders the movement of God in our lives. But you know what? Let's be careful here. We don't want to elevate the power of unbelief to a position where it stops God, that he could not do mighty things because they lack faith. He is God. He is the creator. Little man can't stop him. You know, he wanted to, but couldn't. 
No, this isn't saying that he couldn't do mighty things. It's saying he wouldn't do many mighty things. Why? Because he would not honor unbelief with divine blessing. Well, this is tragic, isn't it? Almighty God was in their midst, and so little was happening. But this tells us Jesus can be present in our life without much happening. Why? Because God has chosen to link much of what he does to man's faith. So the cost of unbelief is huge. We can miss out on many of the blessings God is willing to give us. And we see the principle here. If you don't expect anything from God, you'll probably get what you expect. Now, to see the cost of unbelief, we need to look no further than to the failure of the children of Israel to go into the promised land. They were God's people who were given great promises that God would give them the land and drive out all the inhabitants that were occupying it. But unbelief derailed all that. Look at Hebrews 4 too. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. They failed to enter the rest and the blessings of the promised land. Now, why is their failure important to us? Because scripture tells us we should learn from their example so we don't repeat the same mistakes. And the promised land for us, it's a type of the blessed, abundant Christian life. So this is important. Let's learn from their example why they didn't go into the promised land. If you remember the story in Numbers 13, Moses sends 12 spies into the land. And while they were there, they saw that the land was good. But they also saw walled cities and the Nephilim. These were huge men. It is believed this is the line Goliath came from. So rather than believing God who said he would give them the land and drive out its inhabitants, they only saw the difficulties. The walled cities and the large people, see, they were walking by sight and not by faith, right? In other words, they didn't filter what they saw through God's truth, through his promises, and it defeated them. They were filled with fear, and fear always exaggerates the problem. Look at Numbers 13, 33. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Wow, talk about an exaggeration. But that's what fear-driven emotions will do. So they conclude that if we go in, we're certainly going to be destroyed. And their unbelief affected the whole community. All except Joshua and Caleb wanted to go back to Egypt. Now, here's God's response in Numbers 14. He basically says, fine, you don't believe I will do or can do what I promised. You choose to believe I was lying. Then you won't see me move in power. You will wander in the wilderness and never enter in to enjoy the blessings of what I wanted to give to you. Hebrews 3.19, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The result, they experienced the desert instead of the lush land God had led them to. They wandered in the dry, parched wilderness instead of God's blessings for 40 years until this unbelieving generation died. Only two entered, Joshua and Caleb. Why? Faith. They simply believed God meant what he said and pled with Israel to trust him and go into the land. And this is the simplicity of faith, isn't it? We believe that God will do what he said he would do. But unbelief sees what God says and chooses not to rest in it, implying that God is not trustworthy. Now, what is the lesson we can pull out of all this for the believer? Well, unbelief puts the believer into a wilderness experience that lacks joy peace, and rest, and how many believers are stuck right there. They are not in the world any longer, which is represented by Egypt, but they aren't in the promised land either, enjoying the blessings of God. They are stuck in some miserable existence in between. We could say they have saving faith, but not walking faith. I mean, they trust God for salvation, but not for daily living. It's not a faith that brings peace into their life in times of trouble, and it's not a faith that anticipates God moving in their life. It doesn't really expect anything from our loving Father. Spurgeon said this, You can be saved with small faith in the right object, but with small faith you won't enjoy the journey. Listen, the wilderness is no place for a believer to be dwelling in, not with all the promises available to us, not when Jesus said, I came to bring you fullness of life, the abundant life. So, if I have small faith, I want to correct that. 
I don't like the wilderness. I don't want to be there. So let's look at the cure for unbelief. And let's start with proper thinking because it starts there. Realize unbelief dishonors God. It basically says, I know what you said. I just don't know if I can trust you. Now, if that's true of you, God wants to change that. When Jesus was on earth, he rebuked his disciples for their lack of faith. He wasn't pleased with that, was he? See, we talk about doing all things for God's glory, and that is to be the desire of every believer. And large faith is what is required to do that. Faith that produces rest in times of trial pleases God and brings him glory. Why? Because it shouts out to the watching world that we believe God is trustworthy and his word is reliable. But small faith that panics says just the opposite. So we should be concerned about cultivating a greater faith. But how do we do that? Well, first, be a student of God's word. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. As I read the scriptures, I input the truth I need to guard myself against unbelief. I see what God is like, how much he loves me and wants to take care of me. I see how powerful he is, so this tells me he can take care of me. I see he controls everything. Therefore, the promise that all things work for my good works. Why? Because he's controlling all things to do just that. See, he has filled his book with truth that is designed to defeat panic and produce rest. These are the truths I use in times of adversity to control those emotions that want to panic. Truths that can produce stability when everything around me seems to be rocking. So I must think correctly. The way I do that is to get the Bible into my mind. Second, I must regularly be in God's presence. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us that the fruit of prayer is peace. God's peace given to us. But we will never enjoy that peace if we don't spend time with him in prayer. See, many find it hard to trust Christ because it's hard to trust a stranger. They haven't spent enough time with him to know him well. And this is vital if you want to have large faith. Then the next thing is the application of all this. Practice, practice, practice. You can know the scriptures, but unless you use them, they won't give you peace in times of trouble. But every day, you know what? Things are going to arise that give us the opportunity to practice using God's word, to help us form a habit of thinking before reacting, where we stop ourselves and ask, what scripture would apply here? What response would please God? See, these are opportunities to confront ourselves with hard questions. Am I going to walk by faith or sight here? Am I going to let these circumstances dictate how I think and feel? Or will I control my thinking and emotions through the truth? Am I going to use this opportunity to bring God glory? So today you can start building these holy habits. Practice using truth. Practice having faith and your faith will grow. Exercise it and it will become stronger. So genuine faith believes what God said in his word is true. But it doesn't stop there. Genuine faith acts on the truth it considers to be true applying it to the circumstances of our life. Now, this is going to take discipline, isn't it? When your emotions want to panic, don't let them take you where they want to. You must force truth upon them. And you know what? You may have to do this a hundred times a day, but eventually your emotions are going to line up and submit to that truth that you're imposing upon them. This is the path that leads to growth, peace, joy, and worship as you rest in God. And this brings great honor to God as we live a life that fully trusts him. Well, that is for the believer. What about unbelief and the unbeliever? Now, unbelief is the oldest sin that mankind fell into. In the Garden of Eden, Eve didn't believe God meant it when he said, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will die. So she ate, and the tragic result was death was introduced into the human race. Physical death, and more tragically, spiritual death, where mankind became alienated from God and only fit for hell. Now, the cure. The only solution is a reversal of that unbelief. To believe what God said about your sin and his only solution, which is faith in his son. A faith that must act. 
You must go to him and ask him to save you, trusting him alone for the salvation of your soul. So, a simple look at faith and unbelief. The question is, what are we going to do with this? Just store it away in our brain, in our faith folder, or apply it to our lives? I like what Vance Havner said. He said, nothing is more disastrous than to study faith, analyze faith, make noble resolves of faith, but never actually make the leap of faith. See, you can be an expert on faith, but never really trust God. But let's be people who are experts in the acts of trusting him, living like we have a heavenly father who loves us and promised to care for us. Let's be people who expect great things from a great God. Let's be people of great faith. Well, all right, guys, that's all I got. As usual, thank you for your prayers and for your financial support so that we can keep this thing going. Let's get the word out while we still can, praying that it bears much fruit. All right, I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next video. God bless you.